I first saw Anya when I went to Eat Real LA. It must have been, oh, I can try to remember how old my son was. I think he was two years old. So this must have been five or six year, years ago. And I said, that is a brilliant communicator. Here is everybody, someone saying all the right things that this movement needs as a spokesperson. And I've kind of followed her along after that. She's the CEO of Belcampo Farms. They're donors of this event uh, for the dinner that we actually have here tonight. Uh, so they're on your menu. It's one of the Carpaccio items. They're just really, it's an incredible business. It's an incredible program. The Eat Real um, Festival now happens around the country. There are multiple Eat Reals, right? Not now. Just LA and Oakland. Still, it's a, it's a really incredible program. Um, so without further ado, Anya Fernald. Should I go from the podium? Sure. Okay. So hello, everyone. I will keep this relatively brief, knowing that this is the most difficult slot right before you're all about to get fed a lovely selection of carpaccio. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Anya Fernald. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Belcampo. We're a California ranch, slaughterhouse, and a group of retail restaurant units. Um, we sell 100% of our own farms product through our own shops. Um, this is 12 species, mostly beef, pork, and chicken, but guinea fowl and stuff like that too. Um, we have two members of our team here, Bill Eiler and Rod Dows, and anybody, you guys can raise your hands out there, yes. Um, and those guys can answer any questions about all the specifics of our operation. Um, many people have been asking me questions that I'm in no way qualified to answer, and those two guys are. Um, thank you, Chris, for inviting me to speak this evening for the lovely introduction. You know, I, I was asked to speak about terroir and flavor, and I said, actually, how about I just talk more broadly about taste? And part of the reason why is that I think actually breed... Um, stress, a lot of other culture and social factors are more important in beef than, than terroir itself. Um, and also because I think we have some challenges right now uh, in beef taste. And the challenges are because we're at the very beginning in our industry as grass ranchers in defining what is flavor and what is quality in natural beef. And I have to start out by stating the obvious, which is that we have a problem. We have an exceptional challenge in our industry related to the perception of taste quality in our product. And as you guys know, there's a uniform appreciation in the culinary world for free-range chicken, heritage pork. Pastured grass-fed meat has a more iffy reputation. And I've personally heard many, many food personalities and people in the world of, of culinary, et cetera, talking on about how much they love their free-range chicken broth and how much they like their pork chops made from all the mangalitsa and asabao pork breeds, et cetera. But with beef, it's a different story. Sometimes they have an ethical commitment to it, but they have not been able to fulfill on that because they feel they get pushback from their customers around flavor. Um, sometimes they themselves want to see a really marbled cut and just haven't ever seen that in a grass-fed product. Sometimes they just think our product is tough and fatty enough because of an experience they had 15 years ago or eight years ago, and it's going to take a long time to change their minds. And, you know, I think there's some truth to this, and I think there are some challenges that are related to genetics and to scale. First off, you know, all of us working in grass ranching are working with beef breeds that have been selected for decades to perform well on a food that's fundamentally harmful for them, on grain and corn. And whereas with pork and poultry, farmers can just reach back into the past of heritage breeds and they can find some breeds that perform really well in natural, fairly stressful conditions on the equivalent of rangeland. In the case of beef, our historic breeds are exclusively dairy and work animals. And eating steak and hamburgers is a pretty new phenomenon in terms of how we consume beef. We used to just boil it and salt it, right? Different times now. And, uh, you know, these historic breeds were just designed for other activities. So we don't have that to rely on. The second is really a question of scale. I see many grass producers have you know, significant economic and environmental factors that limit their ability to keep the animals on pasture until they fully finish out and have enough intramuscular fat to meet the market in terms of where the market wants their product right now. Uh, another major issue is post-harvest handling. We haven't heard a lot about that in this conference. And harvest itself, you know, there's a limited number of plants that will take the ex exceptional sort of extra attention to detail that an artisan grass-finished product requires that will take the care and the time uh, and take that beef and will improve it through the harvest and the post-harvest handling. You know, you guys all know you can deliver the most amazing beef standing to a plant and it can pretty much only go down from there. Um, and people are seeing that their product's taste quality is being decreased by the way that it's handled. So these are 
some of our challenges as producers, challenges that we have to think about in terms of how we as a movement advocate for investment in infrastructure, education, and also cultural challenges about how we as a movement address and talk about bringing a consistent, delicious product to market. And in listening to you know, many of the discussions, formal and informal, over the past couple of days, I do think we need a call to action you know, to work together as a movement to deliver on a product that is consistently focused on taste, on deliciousness, and as focused on those deliverables as it is on environmental outcomes and on rangeland preservation. Now, in terms, you know, these are big issues, and meetings like this are starting to work to address some of those issues. We're starting to have conversations about breed, about sourcing animals, about breeding animals, about bringing a bigger development of, of, to premium markets, about giving access to premium markets to all of you growers, um, and better definition of grass-fed as a brand. And I think we need to see a parallel effort to this kind of growing community with us working with harvest and post-harvest handling around education and procedures in those plants and how to handle this really unique grass-finished product. Um, I also think that there's a, a big chance to offer an opportunity around a premium pricing structure for slaughterhouses to really encourage people to, to, to honor the beef, to exalt the beef, to improve the beef through how it's cut and handled. Now, these are the issues that I've talked about right now, which are all issues that we can solve with everybody who's in this room, which is a beautiful thing to know, right? Everything that we've talked about around genetics, around market infrastructure, those are all things that this group of people can deal with through working together collaboratively and through focus and things like that, that are happening this evening in this whole conference. Now, the next challenge is something that goes beyond this room and has to do with a broader set of issues just broadly in the U.S. right now. And in every product, meat, just one among them, over the past 70 years, American animal and plant breeding has focused on yield, pest resistance, and appearance, not on flavor. And the pleasure of an ingredient's taste, of a food's taste, really did not have any practical value in the eyes of who was helping design breeds and products, right? And as everybody in this room knows, flavor means nutrition. Omega-3 fatty acids have flavor. And amazingly, our bodies can draw connections between flavors and the physical responses that they signal, if our bodies are listening to them. All over nature, beyond the human species, animals actually limit their meal size, not because they're stuffed and they couldn't possibly eat another bite, but because they've hit what's called a secondary compound wall. That's all the micronutrients and the antioxidants and the omega-3s. They've met the nutritional needs that go beyond calories. And they've met them, and they've been signaled that through flavor. But in the US, our synthetic flavor technology has been making bland ingredients very attractive. They've been essentially overriding our hardwired systems. And they've been supplying all of this sense of satiety without the benefits, without the healing nutritional benefits of the real food. You know, now in the U.S., I feel like chicken, as it's broadly available, pretty much interchangeable with protein, right? You're going to slather it with your seite sauce. You're going to cover it and drench it. And all of our meats in the modern market, in the industrial market, they're pretty much presented to us and, and considered as a bland substrate for a ton of sauce, for a ton of sugar, salt, and fat to make it all go down easier, right? We've taken the flavor out of meat. We selected that. And... In doing so, we've lost a lot of nutrition, but we've also fooled our bodies into accepting a subpar nutritional food. And that's the real bigger challenge. That's once we solve for our consistency, that's the next piece to tackle. And you know, once we've made our products more consistent as grass-fed meat and more consistently delicious, we really have to remember as a movement to not succumb to the temptation to make it taste like nothing. Natural food tastes like something. Those tastes signify greater flavor and greater nutrition for yourself. And, you know, as the CEO of a meat company, I get asked all the time for, like, what's my steak rub, which to me is, is amazing. It's just salt, right? You guys all cook with your own meats. You pretty much use salt because it tastes really good. It has a lot of flavor. I don't have to put a lot of cumin and cayenne and pepper all over my steaks. I just put salt on it. And, you know, I sell a bacon beef grind in my stores. I don't really feel proud of selling that. I actually think that my grind with a lot of grass-fed, grass-finished fat tastes 
better than beef, than pork mixed with, with, with the beef. You know, I actually like that flavor more than bacon. But, you know, that bacon beef grind, it's a classic thing. You have beef that doesn't taste like much. The fat doesn't have any of those omega-3s. It's not deeply satisfying. You add in the bacon, you add in a layer of smoke and salt and fat to really bump that up and give that little false sense of satiety. Well, we actually are, are creating a redundant flavor when we have grass-fed meat. Our grass-fed flavor has so much richness and so much deep nutrition. It's about teaching our customers to understand that. And I think that the bridge that we need to build is really about the long-term marketing of meat. And it's about making that connection between deliciousness and nutrition. And we need to connect to that sense of satiety that comes from filling up with that secondary compound wall. That's all the antioxidants and the omegas and the micronutrients that really tells our body not just that we're full, but that we've been fed. And how are we going to do this? I mean, how are we actually going to tackle this bigger, like, delicious, tender, meat-eating experience that our customers want, and then also layer that on with giving them a bit more flavor than they're, what they're going to want or what they're expecting in their meat? They, they want this to essentially be the piece of bread upon which the flavor topping is slathered, right? I think that in our marketing, we need a greater emphasis on taste quality, on taste itself, what to expect, how to handle product. And I'm not saying we want to de-emphasize the environmental aspects that we all talk about proudly when we sell our meat, and frankly, why a lot of us got into this in the first place. Um, but when we talk about an environment and when we talk about health, we have to talk about flavor at the same time. Let's not pretend that that issue doesn't exist. We need to bring it forward. We need to talk positively about the flavors in our meat and the deep nutrition that that flavor signifies. And, you know, I look, and one ray of hope for me is that in our markets, in my markets as Belcampo, my fastest growing segment and my most enthusiastic, deep believers are like 28 to 40, younger, interested, eating a lot of liver, um, stuff like that, that I'm certainly surprised by and thrilled by. And I see people who may not be making a lot of money, but who are prioritizing a greater percentage of their income, their disposable wealth for food. That's a very, very important trend. And you look at these young folks and people who are buying a lot of fancy juice, a lot of fancy coffee, and they might be having one cup of coffee instead of three or four. They might be having one juice instead of having the, what, I mean, six bottles of water that maybe the previous generation was having as their luxury. And it's about that flavor and it's about that connection to the, the health that that flavor signifies. If that's the next generation, and let's hope that it is, let's hope that these early signs are speaking to a change, Let's start our conversation with those people, with that next generation around flavor and embrace that direction. Thank you. Wow.